So let's start. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and best wishes for this uh, new year. I'm Frank Pachou, I'm developer advocate at uh, Yugabyte, and this is the first episode of our YFFT, Yugabyte Friday Tech Talk. And it's really an engineer to engineer format. And today we have the, the three Yugabyte founders, Kanan, who is president, Kartik, the CTO, and Michael, the software architect. Can you quickly introduce yourself? Hi, Frank. Uh, thank you. Uh, like you said, I'm, I'm Kanan, one of the co founders at uh, Yugabyte. Uh, and uh, been working with, on databases uh, for a long time now. Uh, Good chunk of it was at uh, Oracle in the database team. And then around mid 2000s, uh, you know, worked on distributed databases at Facebook, which is where I had the pleasure of, uh, you know, meeting Karthik and Mikhail. And uh, you could say we've been working together for almost uh, 15 years now. Thanks. Hi, folks. I'm Karthik, like Kanan said, another of the co founders. And as he said, we've been working together for about 15 years. Um, like uh, we've focused on like, you know, we've actually built um, Apache Cassandra and uh, a lot of features into Apache HBase, which is, uh, and, and it's not just like the three of us, like uh, most of the founding original team is with us here at, uh, at Yugabyte DB and you'll be seeing them in some of the, the subsequent episodes. Anyways, um, so great. it was a great experience building the database, but it was an equally amazing experience running these databases at a pretty large scale at Facebook. So you know, that's where most of us cut our teeth on massive scale and operational uh, stuff around databases and cloud native and so on. And so, yeah, we're going to be talking all things distributed database and cloud native. Mikhail? Um, so my, my name is uh, Mikhail. As uh, Kanan and Carter said, uh, um, we work at uh, f Facebook. So uh, I got introduced to distributed databases uh, uh, when I started working on HBase in the uh, in 2011 or so, uh, when I joined F Facebook, and uh, uh, that's where uh, we uh, built HBase uh, sort of as a service to for many many different teams at Facebook to use. And uh, I mean, my just my uh, experience with distributed systems uh, goes beyond that. I also have some experience with uh, uh, MapReduce style Hadoop systems and so on. But uh, it has been a great journey building uh, Yugabyte DB for the past six years. Great, and it's an honor to have you there. As this is the first episode of YFFT, can you tell the audience about this new series we are launching and what is it about? Sure. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of excitement around distributed SQL as apps are moving to the cloud, right? But there are also tons of questions we get all the time. Like, hey, what are the use cases that distributed SQL or Yugabyte DB is a good fit for? You know, how does backup and restore or, or sharding work? What, what, what are the deployment considerations? Should I use a multi-zone deployment or multi-region? If I'm using multi-region, should I do you know, synchronous replication or async replication? How do I go about investigating a performance issue and so on? So as a team, we are constantly you know, trying to improve here, be it better documentation, or uh, answering questions on the community Slack channel or, or blog posts and such. But along those lines, we thought uh, that a live sort of engineer to engineer format uh, where we are sh sharing this kind of information and, and sparking conversation about distributed SQL uh, or Yugabyte DB would be fun and useful, um, both for the user community, but for also for us as a team you know, to, to get feedback and what are the things that we should be working on. So this is really a, a 30 minute every Friday format. It's live you know, at, and at this time, Pacific time, 9.30 AM. And in each episode, we will have an engineer cover a topic. Maybe it's a product feature, a use case, a best, pra best practice, uh, be it like low level geo partitioning or uh, sharding, how does sharding work and so on. So the main presentation in this 30 minute will, will be typically like a 10 to 12 minute talk by an engineer. And, and we'll try to save a good amount of time for Q&A and the presentations will be recorded and, and available um, even if you can't make this time zone. Uh, and last but not the least, uh, you know, there's a YFTT channel on, on our community Slack. That would be a great uh, forum also to ask questions, give feedback or you know, topic suggestions and so on. Yeah, let, let's continue the questions after, after this 40 
minutes, we, 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 uh, which are quite short, uh, on the Slack channel. And uh, you are the founders. Uh, so the, the first question, what prompted you to start Yugabyte? Can you tell us a bit more about these three, the founding story, and what Yugabyte DB is? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, happy to do that, uh, uh, like uh, Frank and everybody. Like, I think that's the, the number one question we got when starting the project, is why the hell do you want to build another database, right? There's so many of them out there. Well, um, like, like all of us, you know, when we introduced ourselves, we actually built databases at Facebook. And uh, in spite of so many databases existing, we had to build a couple of more databases. And uh, what we found at the end of, as we progressed more and more into the journey was, you know, even those databases, it solved a certain set of problems, but it wasn't as universally applicable, right? Like, and maybe I'll, I'll explain the journey that'll make it um, easier to understand. Um, like today, most of the applications and services are being built in the cloud, right? And what does the cloud really have to offer? Well, if you really peel back everything else, right? At the end, the cloud still has VMs and, and you know, machines and you still run services and so on. But the big thing is, firstly, your cloud gives you infinite compute or infinite set of resources. You can ask for a machine and get it in a few minutes, right? Like it's, it's the best thing about the cloud. Um, before the cloud, the biggest impediment to software development was how quickly you could get machines racked, stacked, ordered, and so on, right? And it was a quite a, like I remember back in the day at Facebook when we were building Apache Cassandra or what became Apache Cassandra, we ordered the machines before we started building the database because we knew we'd get the database built in eight, nine months, but we wouldn't get the machines if we didn't order up front. Well, you can kind of imagine you haven't even built the database for the application. You don't know what's going to happen, but let's just order machines because if it's not useful, somebody else will use it anyway, right? Like that, those were the days. So in this age of machines being readily available in a few minutes away, the second thing that happens is these machines are inherently going to fail at some point because it has to be commodity in order to keep up with this kind of growth. So it's important to build a database that can always be available and irrespective of whether it's a failure, it's a software upgrade, whatever it is, right? The third thing the cloud changes is like, again, I remember back in 2007 at Facebook, we had two data centers, right? And we had a massive project uh, where we wanted to make both of them operational and know that if one failed, we would always be able to pick it up from the other seamlessly, right? And that was a massive project, right? And today there's 200 of these regions and data centers available. So to summarize, you need these three features, which is uh, scale, uh, always available and replicate data across different data centers, giving different SLAs and features, but you need to do so while retaining the power of whatever the languages the users are using, the developers are using. You can't compromise on that. You can't say, I'll give you all of this stuff, but how about I take it all away and just give you key value? Well, how much is that? That's not really useful, right? So what, what we thought about doing here was to take the relational um, like feature set and completely map it to the cloud native world, which gives you these three extra features. So you could think of this as Postgres meets uh, scale on demand, always available and replicated internally. Right. So that, that's really, but I don't, I don't know if you folks, uh, Ken and Mikhail want to, want to add something based on our experience or so on. Right. But uh, yeah. I think you covered it. Karthik. That's awesome. Yeah, and, and, and then as you realize there that you need those SQL features on top of it, uh, maybe Mikhail, you can describe the architecture at high level. So uh, you combine the architecture is, uh, uh, is a, a really a modular. It has a, a few different layers. So the layer that the user deals with is uh, the query processing layer where we reuse the Postgres code base and it could be compared to AWS Aurora in that respect. So it gives us uh, the, the full, um, it gives our users the full power of uh, Postgres uh, uh, SQL. And uh, then uh, underneath that, there is a, a distributed scalability layer that uh, provides all of these features such as sharding, uh, replication, uh, failover, and it manages storage on each node and it also uh, supports distributed transactions. So that layer is, uh, is sort of the core of the distributed system, and that is that compared to uh, Google Spanner. And uh, another unique feature of uh, uh, Yugabyte DB's architecture is that it, there isn't there isn't just the SQL query layer, uh, but there are actually multiple different query layers. Um, we also support uh, an API called YSQL, uh, which is uh, compatible compatible to Cassandra, and uh, uh, we also support. Um, an API inspired by Redis. So, and in the future, there could be more APIs 
added on, onto the same uh, scalable core. So it's a, re a really modular architect architecture that uh, gives user the users the full power of uh, uh, horizontally scalable uh, database with uh, the APIs that they are comfortable with. Well, one thing as, as you were talking, Mikhail, I was thinking like maybe Kanan, you can comment on this. The first point, right? Like which was really about how it gives the whole power of Postgres SQL, right? Like you, you were at Oracle, right? You've seen the power of Oracle and like from a language and feature set standpoint, right? Can you talk about the complexity of what a relational or some of these, like, you know, databases like MySQL, Postgres, Oracle DB, they're so powerful, right? Can you talk a little bit about that and how difficult it is to replicate this, this feature set and so on? Yeah, I mean, one of the cool things about uh, relational databases is, uh, is the data modeling flexibility that comes with uh, the power of SQL and also the query flexibility. So things that have been pretty standard uh, in such in these databases, whether it be indexing or multi-row, multi-table operations, multi-table transactions, point in time restore. These are, are such core building blocks that uh, you know, enable developers to write productive applications. Like if you don't have indexing or multi-table transactions, which is sort of like in the, the NoSQL world, you often have to jump through hoops to, to do something as basic as moving $10 from one row to another row in one atomic transaction. Uh, and you know, what we have focused on is bringing all that developer productivity that comes with SQL to, to a distributed architecture. It has its challenges, uh, but there's a path in implementing that. And that's uh, maybe like, you know, we'll talk about some of the hard things uh, in, in building that. Yeah, and also maybe maybe about other decisions, the, the trade-offs you had to do for this innovation, like the open source model and other hard decisions you had to make. Yeah, I think that's a, yeah, that's an interesting uh, question, right? Like I think at the first and foremost is what are we going to support, right? And, and uh, the way we started out was, uh, you know, we wanted to build this database that was cloud native, right? And the most um, simple way to start out is, hey, what language API do we want to emulate? We can go build our own, we can emulate an existing one. And like I said, the number one question that every database maker has to answer is why the hell they're building the database, right? So we really did some soul searching and we realized you know what, we're not really going to innovate on the API that much. That's really not the value because there's so many databases. That's what people mean when they say there's so many, right? So we're going to take existing APIs and extend them to work well in cloud native because these, these databases are really loved and people know how to use them. Why reinvent the wheel, right? So we said, okay, we're going to take an existing flavor of a relational database. Which one should it be? And uh, it naturally just came down to Postgres SQL or MySQL, right? Just based on adoption availability, we wanted to make it open source. We knew that from day one. So we just thought, okay, let's pick between the two. Uh, remember it was back in 2016. The answer that it was Postgres SQL was not that obvious back then. So, but we still picked Postgres SQL because after doing an analysis, a careful analysis of the feature set that Postgres contains and comparing it to databases like Oracle, like DB2, like SQL Server, which are incredibly powerful, we felt that uh, Postgres had a little more extensibility and more feature set to offer compared to MySQL. The second thing was Postgres's license was completely open and that was more in our ethos also. We wanted to make it like, you know, Apache QR, if you're making it open source, make it open source, right? Um, by the way, MySQL had great reasons to do their GPL license, no comments on that, but it just, for the times, right? For the current time, it just feels like Apache license is a, is a better one to go. So we picked the PG layer and we said, you know, how hard can it be? Let's rewrite this in C++ the way we wanted to do it, like completely cloud native and so on. And after five to six months, we six months we realized we're not going to get anywhere with this. It's, it's going to take forever to build the language layer. It's equally hard building that. So then we said, let's reuse Postgres, but that that presented a new type of risk. Are we even going to get through this? So we debugged and we spent the first bit de-risking that piece of the project to make sure it actually works, which it fortunately did, thankfully for all of us. And uh, the language choice is pretty obvious, right? Like if you're picking Postgres, it's in C++. If we're picking RocksDB as a starting point. It points to C++. So, you know, we started with C++, but we also wanted to ensure, you know, we didn't, we we had already done a lot of Java databases, Cassandra and HBase managed memory. And, you know, managed memory databases, they do well up to a certain point, but when you really want to run high performance, it starts to become a problem. So, so we went with C++. Um, the next big decision for us was how to synchronize clocks, right? The, the database that did all of this architecturally was Google Spanner and they have atomic clocks with GPS and, and we couldn't tell people, you know what, we, everything worked great, but just get your own GPS clock, right? So, so we said, we have to come up with how to synchronize clocks logically. So we, we picked the hybrid logical clock algorithm and did a whole bunch of improvements and tweaks to it in order to make it safe and high performance. 
And lastly, you know, we started Open Core because the wisdom in 2016 told us, you know what, if that's the only business model for open source companies, right? If you're going open source, you got to make it open core. But we realized in databases that the value is really in the database as a service layer and not really in the database itself. Like, like Aurora, for example, has done a phenomenal job of building a commercial business on top of MySQL and Postgres, which are 100% open, right? So we said that's the model we wanted to go towards. So database fully open and DBAS is where we will build the commercial side of the company. Right? Yeah, there's there's a whole bunch more. I'm sure yeah, Kanan and Mikhail can attest to this. Like, you know, it was like almost at a certain point every month we had to come up with a new type of uh, problem to solve and we had to come up. A new type of problem came up and we had to solve it. And there were always questions back and forth and, you know, interesting decisions to make. But uh, but yeah, I think, yeah, I don't know if you guys have others to add. And about the, those problem, what, what was the... the... The most challenging to to build, Mikhail, for example, uh, was it the distributed uh, transaction? Was it the, the the replication sync async? So there are a lot of uh, features that were quite challenging to build. Uh, I think at the top of the list, uh, uh, Postgres compatibility is a kind of uh, uh, a really challenging feature because we had to reuse the Postgres code base, but then we had to with our small engineering team at the time and uh, uh, still we're, we're a small team, we're a startup, but uh, we had to understand the 100, like 1 million line Postgres uh, uh, data, database code written in C and we, we needed to find the part that uh, we, we needed to decouple the storage layer, which is quite tightly coupled uh, with the rest, with the query processing engine and Postgres and redirect that to our distributed system which is uh, actually uh, a segue into the other uh, challenging feature, which is uh, the distributed transactions layer. So we had to integrate the Postgres uh, query processing layer with our underlying distributed transactions, which is uh, by itself, as uh, uh, Conan said, it's an essential feature for any um, database application, like um, atomically transferring, like, uh, from one account to another account where the two accounts could be on completely different nodes is uh, really important. And we use uh, a transaction model, which is uh, fully distributed. So there is no centralized node that keeps track of all transactions. The transaction status tracking is, is fully distributed across uh, the, the machines of the cluster. Um, and um, because the data moves from the uncommitted to committed state through multiple layers, we had to uh, um, design and test that uh, really carefully uh, because the data has to, the data is atomically committed, but still there is some uh, background operation that moves the data finally into the place uh, where it's going to be indistinguishable from data that was, is written as a part of a simple key value store type of uh, write operation. Then uh, another feature is uh, another set of features actually are the improvements to the RAF protocol because our distributed storage and transactions layers uh, layer uses the RAF protocol to synchronize the data within each uh, shard uh, for the shard to, to reach consensus on what is written and what, what, has, been, what has failed to, to be written. And uh, the RAF protocol is a well-known protocol uh, developed at Stanford in 2012, but we uh, had to add a lot of enhancements to it for our use cases. Uh, which are, for example, how do you guarantee that uh, um, it's safe to work with just one node, which is the leader of the raft group? We need something called leader releases for that. And then uh, how do we group multiple entries together uh, so that we, we reduce the latency of writing to disk? That's called the group commit. And uh, then to reduce latency for geographical distributed deployments, we needed to um, implement a uh, the preferred leader feature where the customer could say, uh, the user could say, we put uh, all the, the application in a particular region or availability zone, and then it interacts with the database, but the database arranges it so that all the leaders of all the shards are also in that preferred region or zone so that the latency from the application to the database is low. And uh, one, probably like one of the hardest features and the distinguishing feature of Yugabyte DB is a, a cross-cluster multi-region replication. So you could have multiple clusters. Uh, you could have two clusters, for example, where one cluster continuously pushes the data to the other cluster, which could be in a completely different part of the world. And the link between the two clusters could even be broken. And the second cluster will just catch up uh, whenever the link is restored. 
So that's different from uh, rough based systems, from consensus based systems, which require the majority of the cluster. So you could have multiple consensus based systems, multiple Yugabyte DB clusters, but uh, you could replicate from one to another in this asynchronous way, and you could you could even do um, asynchronous, I mean, bidirectional replication. So of yeah, course, the, the, the last with... point. The last point I just wanted to add is especially interesting because you know a lot of the relational architecture right of applications is that right. That's the dominant way to re replicate data across regions. And while a bunch of the uh, features, the, well, a bunch of these uh, applications could move to synchronous replication, you know, because there's no synchronous replication, and now you have it. Not all of them can, right? So it's still very important. I see that's what we find. We find that asynchronous replication is still pretty critical. And if you, if you really think about it, doing all this stuff in a distributed M to N nodes and, you know, it's just like a, a pretty fun, but very challenging problem as we can say, so. Yeah, exactly. It's, it kind of uh, repeats the patterns that people are used to in the traditional RDBMS world where you could have like primary and secondary nodes in different regions. But uh, now all of these nodes become distributed clusters, which are themselves fully resilient. Yeah. I'm sure there are a lot of questions and in the chat there is the link to the to the Slack channel. I think given the time, a lot of questions can be answered uh, later. As a developer advocate, there's something I, I, I want to be sure we address because I don't want people to get frustrated by uh, using the wrong tool in the wrong place. Yugabyte DB doesn't solve all problems. So can you tell us what is the use case for it? And most important, uh, what are the anti-patterns where it cannot be a good fit? Sure, Frank, uh, happy to take that question. Uh, you know, like I think in, our, in the previous discussion, we talked, Karthik covered like, you know, what are some of the use cases for which Yugabyte DB is a great fit, especially for applications that need scale, you know, active, active resilience and, and geo distribution, right? Uh, but it's important to highlight that it's it's not a you know solve all type of database right it's a one database fits all right so firstly if you look at sort of the application spectrum around databases you can kind of put them in the OLTP to OLAP spectrum OLTP standing for transactional online applications all the way to analytics like business intelligence and reporting type of queries data warehousing right. So we are primarily uh, an OLTP database designed for like, you know, customer facing online applications, whether it is like your login flow or, you know, checking your inventory uh, shopping cart or building a, a messenger or Gmail like application, right? So where you, there are thousands of users logging into your system. They are, they're looking at their records, updating their records and so on. So you can buy this primarily an OLTP database. It is not an analytics database. So even though you know, Yugabyte supports SQL and group by and aggregations and all that, if your primary use case is analytics or reporting, that's not Yugabyte DB's primary strength, right? So that's something worth uh, calling out. Now, the second aspect sometimes is even within OLTP applications, if, if you're, there are pros and cons of a single node database architecture versus a distributed architecture. Like if your app didn't really need the scale or you know, multi-zone replication and, and a low level you know, geo distribution and so on, then it is it can be hard to match the performance of what a single node database can do. So picking the right use case, paying attention to the schema as you might, if an app is sort of coming from a previously you know, designed for a monolithic database and now moving to a distributed architecture, uh, you know, going through that process carefully and you know, watching out for the common pitfalls, like, you know, something as simple as having a timestamp based index might work just fine in a single node application. But once you have a distributed architecture, if you have a sorted index on a timestamp column, you know, now suddenly you're creating a hotspot in your distributed system. So thinking about, you know, data uh, schema, denormalization if needed and so on is going to be an important part. So like, it's not all magic. Some, some caution has to be taken, you know, when moving to a distributed architecture. Great. Uh, maybe in, in two minutes, uh, Mikhail, can, can you tell us about the, what is complex in getting the, these new releases uh, with this cadence? because we are putting a lot of features every month. Uh, so in order to have a, a good velocity for uh, new for releasing um, new versions of the database, uh, we have to 
have a great CI CD system, continuous integration and continuous delivery system in the uh, in our uh, engineering organization. So um, what we do is we have uh, um, a lot of uh, tests. We, we run um, hundreds of thousands of unit tests on uh, thousands of cloud instances every day. Uh, we then have uh, uh, a lot of uh, integration tests, uh, uh, which uh, test integration with various cloud providers. And uh, uh, another set of issues are uh, called at that point. And then uh, we have uh, performance testing, long running clusters where we really test the resilience of the system. We also have uh, uh, consistency testing with uh, uh, something uh, with a test suite called Jepson, uh, which uh, tries to inject failures into cluster operation and uh, verifies that the database still behaves correctly from the point of view of uh, transactional consistency. And um, so because we develop code in C and C++, we have to be really careful about uh, um, memory access and uh, finding things like, uh, and it, actually concurrency and erase conditions are uh, are applicable also to, to other technologies as well, not just C and C++. And for that, we use the uh, variety of industry standard tools, uh, 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 such as uh, uh, various sanitizers in the LLVM tool chain and uh, um, like address sanitizer, thread sanitizer. Um, we, we also do our builds on a variety of platforms, Mac OS and Linux. Mac OS for developers primarily, Linux is the primary uh, deployment platform. So yeah, it's quite a complex pipeline and uh, we have to keep improving it in order to be able to uh, release new versions quickly. Uh, one, one thing I'll just mention in like literally five, 10 seconds is that like, you know, Mikhail is super passionate about this area and uh, he literally built some of these tools by hand. Like we have this tool internally called detective, awesome UI, awesome way to compare like every, every diff that anybody uploads, right? It automatically bids for a spot instance and to minimize cost because we have to keep that in mind too. And, you know, run the regression test and report on it even before the reviewer can get to it. So just like, yeah, he's like, it could be a whole topic in itself, I guess. So <laughs> yeah, we'll sure. in a future session, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we will have other sessions and, and uh, we try to, to keep it short in uh, in half an hour. So it's just time to to introduce the next uh, Friday talk. We, we have a comment on the chat about the maturity of Postgres and next Friday will be about uh, this SQL layer and Postgres, uh, uh, Postgres SQL on, on top of it. And uh, we have the community Slack with the YFFT channel. So in this channel, you can ask questions later and Kartik, Kanan and Mikhail uh, will, uh, will answer them. Okay, so thank you very much for this. It's not easy to have all the founders of a company at the same time, so that was great. And uh, see you next uh, Friday on another topic. Thank, thank, thank you. you, Frank, for hosting, and uh, that was awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.